and welcome to On The Ledge Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Perone, and this week we are containing our excitement. Now I know I sound as excitable as somebody who's been poked with a sharp stick, but summer's here, folks. And any time I need a boost, I can just go and feel up my tomato plants and enjoy the wonderful scent of fresh tomato leaves. Does that make you feel good? Maybe it's just me. In this week's episode, I am treading slightly away from On The Ledge's core topic of houseplants. But that's okay. The show's been going six and a half years. I think we can cope with a little bit of mission creep because this week we're talking growing food in containers with Mark Ridzel smith of the wonderful website Vertical Veg. He's also the author of an award-winning book, The Vertical Veg Guide to Container Gardening. So I find out what crops do and don't work in containers, what you can grow on your windowsill, and how you can avoid falling into common mistakes people make when starting out with a container food garden. Plus, I answer a question about grow lights. Now, I do love a message that makes me feel good. And that's exactly what I got from JK on Instagram this week. Over there, I'm at j.l.perone. The message from JK read as follows. I love your podcast and I wanted to let you know you have inspired me to be more involved with our local orchid society. I spent several hours yesterday with the chairman, who was lovely enough to show us his greenhouse. I'm planning on helping him organise and repot his plants, and I'm so excited. Thank you for the inspiration. Well, thank you, JK, for the inspiration, and I'm so glad that you're getting involved with your local orchid society. That's great news. Quick reminder, if you are in the UK and you want a signed and dedicated copy of my book, Legends of the Leaf, get in touch you can contact me directly and I will get that organised for you. I don't have many copies available uh, for that because it's a lot of work to send them out, but I do have a few. So if you're a dedicated listener to the show, uh, I'm not advertising this really anywhere else. So if you're a dedicated listener to the show, please get in touch and I will sort you a copy. The book's uh, going down very well. A couple of really nice reviews on Amazon. But, you know, us authors, we're always hungry for more. So if you've read Legends of the Leaf and you want to leave a review, do go to Goodreads or Amazon or anywhere else you can leave a review and say something nice. I'm sure that in your next life, you will be rewarded for this excellent behaviour. And if you're not subscribed to The Plant Ledger, my email newsletter about the houseplant scene, then head on over to janeperone.com forward slash ledger and take a look. Comes out every Friday. It's packed. I mean packed full of good planty information. And I'd love you to subscribe. You will not regret it, I'm sure. And you also get a free guide. Yes, that's free to dealing with fungus gnats. And it doesn't just tell you to put cinnamon on the soil. Oh no, it gives you good, in-depth, accurate info on treating this particular houseplant problem. So do check that out, janeperone.com forward slash ledger. On with the business of this week's show. Mark Ridsell smith I've admired from afar for quite a few years now. He is the container gardener extraordinaire. So if you don't have a garden, if you only have a porch or a patio, balcony, terrace, a set of steps, or even just a windowsill indoors, this guy is somebody to listen to. Do check out his website, verticalveg.org.uk. And here's my chat with him where we cover everything from how much we love runner beans to how to grow cardamom indoors. Hello, I'm Mark, Mark Ridstall Smith, and uh, I grow food (laughs) uh, in containers. And I started by accident, really. I lived in a flat, a small flat in London. And I just had a balcony. I didn't have any out, any um, garden or allotment, but I had this desperate yearning to grow food. And uh, I started just for fun, not really expecting very much, and discovered that I could actually grow a lot of food. 
And as well as that, I found that I started meeting my neighbors who were intrigued by the plants I was growing. And uh, we started eating uh, much better food, much more vegetables, started recycling our waste food, and basically just sort of changed the way we lived in the city. You know, we were living in surrounded by concrete, but suddenly we were surrounded by plants as well. And uh, after that experience, I started Vertical Veg to uh, try and inspire more people who don't have gardens to grow food in containers at home. I've always been impressed when I'm looking at your social media at quite how madly green your <laughs> your container areas are. I absolutely feel inspired by what you do, Mark. What is it about growing food in containers that you love? I guess the obvious thing is you were forced into it not having any other outdoor space, but what are the things that you can really mark out as a plus? that you maybe don't get growing in on allotment or in the ground? That's a really interesting question. And we do now have an allotment. Since moving to Newcastle uh, 10 years ago, it's easy to get, well, easier to get an allotment here. So it's quite interesting because I can compare the two because I still grow at home. I have a concrete uh, front yard where I grow in containers. And the thing I love about the container gardening is that it's at home, it's on the doorstep. And that means I can enjoy it every day and I every time I go in and out of the house um, or I can see them through f- from the windows sort of inside uh, the house and it's just so convenient when I'm cooking you know I'll grow a lot of herbs and salads at home and just being able to pop outside in, in, in one minute <laughs> and pick some fresh herbs um, is, is really rewarding so I love that aspect of it. And the other thing I, I really like about it, and I think many of us who grow in the middle of a city find, is that somehow it's almost more re- miraculous that, you know, when you've got like, I mean, my front yard is like a really, was when we moved in, a really ugly bit of concrete. I can't really tell you how ugly it was. And when you get streets full of these, it's just really bleak and depressing but with containers you know you can suddenly change that space into a space which is uh, full of life uh vibrant bees come and visit birds you know you don't always want the birds because they dig things up and all the rest of it but it, it's still it's for life there which changes the feel of it and i think it changes the feel of it people not just for you personally but for other people who live in the area um so yes that's why i love that's why i love container gardening oh that's a really good answer you're right convenience is all i grow a few things in containers i mean i have a reasonably sized garden i guess my main thing is potatoes and because my daughter is a bit of a potato addict (laughs) and the thing i like about harvesting potatoes in containers is it's just really quick and a lot less messy And you can find them all. Like, it's not like in the ground where you're going to leave any behind. So those are my pros. (laughs) Very specific ones for container growing. And kids love harvesting. There's something really special about doing it with with children, emptying a a, a container full of potatoes. They they absolutely love it. it. It really is a voyage of discovery. For a few years, I was keeping records. I've lapsed in recent years, but I was keeping records of my potato harvests. And it's always interesting to see, oh, this year I got another 200 grams out of that bag and <laughs> just measuring up how much you get. It's never going to be a huge harvest, but it's, it's, it's as you say, it's tremendous fun. And it's enough to have one or two meals. I mean, you're never going to be self-sufficient in potatoes, are you? But there's something really nice about having a few bowls of new potatoes that you've just dug up. Um, yeah, that's all. I, that's all I need really is a few bowls of new potatoes. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a lovely it's a lovely thing to start the year. It is, it is, yes. And uh, I've got my daughter involved with planting them this year. I mean, she's sixteen; she's not a toddler or anything. But uh, she's taken <laughs> a long time to get into doing stuff in the garden. But she's quite excited because you know I've got a waxy potato and I've got a flowery potato. And as a potato connoisseur, she's quite looking forward to that. So we shall see now. I think one of the things about container gardening is it's a it's a low entry bar because you just need some kind of container and a bit of uh, some kind of hard standing. But are there things that people tend to get wrong when they're starting out in this journey? Any bits of advice from somebody who's been there and done that with uh, this particular kind of gardening? I mean, the thing about container gardening is it is really, really simple. Um, on one level, it's really simple. Uh, but there are a few 
the mistakes, but it is it is very easy to make if you've never done it before. And a lot of people who never done it before don't have much, you know, often don't have much reference to people, you know, who you know who, who they can speak to about it. Um, so the common things that I find is it's very easy to assume that all the stuff you buy labelled as potting mix in the shops is all the same. Um, but of course, people who grow know that it does actually vary quite a lot in quality. So the stuff you get from the, the cheap, uh, from a supermarket, um, is the main thing about it, it's not necessarily bad, but the main thing about it is it's much more inconsistent than the more expensive sort of brands. And for experienced growers, that doesn't really matter so much because they can see if, how well something's performing and they can do something to correct it. But if you're a new grower, sometimes things just don't grow very well and people think, oh, I can't grow, I can't grow. <laughs> but actually, they've done nothing at all wrong. It's just that the potting mix that they're using, um, unfortunately, has is not very good um, quality. So that's one common thing. Another thing is um, a lot of people look on things like Pinterest and there's a lot of... Uh, images on there people creating like bottle gardens and you know it it's a fun thing to do to grow in bottles and it's possible but it's also difficult because the volume of the of a bottle is small which means it dries out very quickly and um there's not that much space for the roots and it's much much easier to grow in in a larger in larger containers um so I always recommend people to, I mean, it does depend on what you're growing. So leafy veg, you can grow in small containers and they'll grow into small plants. But if you're growing things like tomatoes uh, and other sort of fruiting crops, then it's much, much easier to grow them in um, larger containers. And the other mistake, I mean, I made all these mistakes myself. <laughs> I hasten to add, so I sort of learned the hard way. But another thing, uh, one of the things I did was I grew Rocket one year and was quite pleased with myself So I uh, because it did quite well. And then I grew it again this next year in the same pot and didn't realise that all the nutrients in the, um, in the potting mix had been used up. Uh, I mean, of course, the second year, it didn't really grow at all. Um, and, you know, I've, I did then I've subsequently learn that you do need to feed plants in containers for them to 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 grow well and if you want to reuse compost which is quite possible to do um you need to add in some fertilizer or some sort of um uh nutrients and and the other also of course the classic mistake which is really easy to do when you when you start out um and particularly when you don't have very many containers because you don't have a lot invested in it um is you just forget to water <laughs> and i was really bad at that um and uh yeah and plants and containers just do you know i often think of them as like you know babies you know they do need looking after from us um you, you know whereas uh you know plants in the ground are a bit more like wild animals they can sort of fend for themselves um in containers they really do uh, need our care and if we forget to water them um, they don't do very well. So I often recommend that people get, you know, more than like one or two containers so they have sort of more invested in it because I think if you've got a bit more invested in it, um, it's easier to remember and then just having like a routine uh, every day just uh, uh, really helps. But those are probably the main things. The only other thing I would probably say is it's very easy to be over-optimistic about how much sun <laughs> your space gets because <laughs> uh, people come home from work, you know, and it's lovely and sunny on their balcony or whatever. Um, they're not there for the rest of the day when they see actually it's all in, in full shade. Um, and a lot of a lot of urban spaces are quite shady and that does make quite a big difference to how well grown. You can grow things on shady uh, balconies and shady spaces. It's just you have to choose carefully and things like chilies and tomatoes i have a lot of emails from people who <laughs> tell me about how what wonderfully their tomato plant grew but it never the fruit never ripened and in most cases that's because it simply hasn't got enough sun what is it with tomatoes everybody the first thing they want to grow is tomatoes and i often think gosh that's really not the easiest thing to start out with but particularly as you say because unless you've got a lovely sun trap they may well not get enough sun. Uh, and they're not the easiest, you know, as, as a sort of a tender Mediterranean crop, they're not that easy. Uh, yeah, and they need a long time. They need quite a long growing period as well. So you have to, and people go away, you know, they do really well and they uh, <laughs> into mid-July and then people go on holiday <laughs> and they come back and they've sort of shriveled up, Yeah, Yeah, that is the problem. And going back to the watering, I think the other thing with watering is that people sort of think, well, it's rain today, 
they'll be fine. And, you know, if you're on a, a, a covered space like a balcony, you probably haven't got much rain. And even if it's not covered, actually not that much rain gets into the pot. You know, they, they still need watering. And, and that's something that certainly I've been caught out with in the past. Yeah, I still get I still get caught out with it. And the other thing people really get caught out with, and it's really weird how long it took me to to realise this myself because it's so obvious when you say it, but it's not easy to realise when pe- people when you start out. But as plants get bigger in containers, they need more water, mm. <laughs> and that's so obvious when I say it. But people, you know, like when you start growing a potato, it, it's it doesn't need very much water. You don't need, but people love it at that point. You know, they they cherish it. They're giving it, you know, it's shooting up a little shoot. They're giving it loads of water because they're like wanting it to grow. But then when it gets big and bushy, they sort of forget about it a bit. Mm-hmm. But it's at that point where it actually needs masses of water because it's got this great big root system. It's got all all these big leaves which are like waving about in the wind and losing water so it's just it's just sort of like sort of just sort of built into your mind that as plants get bigger they need more and more water in their that's, containers. that's very very true um now when it comes to the containers themselves again as you've already indicated with the compost it can get expensive pretty quickly if you're going to go to the garden center and buy a load of brand spanking new containers for your veg Are there some thrifty ways that you can cut down those expenses? What kind of things do you use for containers? It's really interesting, Matt, because I think it's this sort of growing is one of those things where you can grow it at almost almost any budget, really. It's very easy to spend very, very large sums of money um, on it. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's, you know, that's, that's, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but it is also possible to grow on extremely uh, low budget. There's a lot of containers you can find for free. Um, they often tend to turn up when you're not looking for them. <laughs> that's the only thing. Um, but there's a lot of things you can use. So things like, uh, those, uh, veg, uh, supermarket crates. Um, I was given lots by a, a food bank near here who just, the supermarket weren't collecting them from them. Um, you can use old recycling bins if you uh, if you get them. Um, those mushroom trays with sort of holes in, you just need to line those with newspaper. I mean, the only thing is there is a certain sort of aesthetic with those sorts of recycled containers, which, you know, quite understandably doesn't suit, you know, every space. But often there is a way to make them look nice if you want to. So I have them at the front of my house. And what I've done is I've just got like a wooden facade, which is just very simple, but just a bit of wood to hide them. So it looks like a a bit like a raised bed, but actually inside um, there's a, there's a plastic, um, a plastic container. Um, And when when you look around and if you go on, you know, the internet, you can find loads and loads of ideas. I mean, people use things like washing machine tubs, you know, the metal bit from the inside of washing machine Mm. tubs, old hot water tanks. um, I mean, old, there's been so many different things people use barrels um and but the other the other thing i would say the other sort of thing i would say for saving money um is uh you can reuse you know once you've bought the 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 potting mix you can reuse it um again every year and that really saves a lot of time and makes it also a lot more economical and and the other thing i say as well with plants and things another thing you can do which i think is is a really is really good fun as well is rather than going to a garden centre or buying them online, is look out for local community uh, plant sales and plant swaps. So often like community gardens and things will have plant sales. And there, normally the plants are a fraction of the price. They're grown locally. And normally when you buy them, you also get lots of good advice <laughs> from the person who's grown them. And, um, you know, I think the community aspect of growing, particularly in cities, uh, is a lovely way for people to uh, bond together um so yeah there's lots of ways that you can grow you know you can cut the cost of growing really quite significantly yeah fantastic advice i love a good allotment there's an allotment plant sale um that happens every year where i live where they sell all this extra stuff they've grown which is amazing and you know my porch is rarely bare of either something i'm giving away to somebody or something somebody's giving to me so uh (laughs) i love that kind of thing. And you do, as you say, you're saving so much money. And it also means that the the miles the plants had to travel are massively reduced, which is great.
more container gardening chat soon but now it's time for question of the week and this one comes from Laura who was asking about grow light recommendations for the UK now I can make some specific recommendations uh, on UK grow lights because obviously that's where I'm based and those are the ones that I can get hold of but also I think there are some general points to make about grow lights, which are apply wherever you live. And do go back and listen to my episode with Leslie Halleck, where we go deep into the subject of grow lights. Here, I'm going to be talking specifically about LED grow lights, because those are the ones that I've had experience using. So here in the UK, there are a few brands available. And the ones that I have had direct experience with are mainly the Mother Dot Life grow lights. These actually come from Belgium, but they sell across Europe and I think actually across the world. What I like about these lights is the fact that they have been designed to be sustainable. What does that mean? I prefer to buy lights that are going to last. And these ones I do believe are going to last. They come with a four year warranty and they're designed specifically to have components that can be um, replaced and repaired without actually having to just be chucked away like so many things we buy these days. So yeah, if you can repair something, um, that that is a big plus for me. So Mother Grow Lights, the plant spectrum is the one that I have and you can either mount it as a vertical or horizontally. So you've got different options. Um, you can hang them as well. There are different mounts available on their website. So Mother Dot Life are the ones that I would probably recommend first in terms of ones that are easily available in the UK. I also have Soltec grow lights. And as you know, I've advertised these on the show before. They are fantastic. If you're buying in the UK, then you are going to face higher shipping costs because as far as I know, and I hope Soltec will correct me if I'm wrong, they don't have a UK distributor. Um, Obviously, that may change and, you know, do contact them and say, please, please uh, get a UK distributor. Their lights are fantastic. I do have some and they're very sturdy. And I would also recommend these for the same reasons that I recommend Mother.Life. They are going to last um, and they won't be like these things you buy very cheaply online that just go plonk after a short amount of time. The other grow light bulbs I have are the ones from Ikea. Unfortunately, these don't seem to be available in the UK anymore. I have occasionally seen them available secondhand or, you know, on places like eBay. So you might be able to pick one of those up. I found them to be reliable and you can screw them into normal size light fitting. So if you can get your hands on those, they are definitely um, worth a look. So those are my personal experiences. If you're looking for grow lights, what I would say is just have a look at what you're being offered in terms of warranty. How long is that light bulb going to um, be guaranteed for? If it fails, some lights seem to fail very quickly. Um, And it's really frustrating if you've spent money on a light and within a few months it stops working. So yeah, check the guarantee, the warranty. How long has it got? Can you send it back? And, you know, is this product designed to have replaceable parts? That's something I would really want to be asking now. You know, is it something where I could recycle this or I can replace the parts? Um, That's what I want to know when I'm buying a new product. I, I don't just want to be adding to the massive pile of of discarded electronics that we're all building up. And if you are thinking about grow lights, the other consideration is looks. And again, Mother.Life and Soltec lights, they look really good. They're going to fit into your decor without looking like you're in a commercial grow room. Um, So again, if that's a consideration, that's something worth bearing in mind. But yeah, save up, spend as much as you can initially on a really good quality grow light and it should save you money in the long run. So I do hope that helps, Laura, and let me know your grow light experiences. What have really worked for you? What have been a complete failure? And what would you recommend? 
I think we're all moving past that phase of where we're happy with purple glowing lights in our front room. We all want white lights these days, don't we? Um, So, you know, it's really up to these grow light companies to start stepping up in terms of looks, but also sustainability, just like every other product. They should be something that we can have around for years to come. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line. On The Ledge podcast at gmail.com is the address to use. And now back to my chat on growing food in containers. Are there any particular food crops that don't work in containers that we should avoid? I mean, we've talked a little bit about potatoes and tomatoes, both of which work pretty well as long as you kind of get the technique right. But is there anything where you just say, don't bother trying this? It really just needs to be in the ground. I don't think there's anything which you can't grow in in containers. I think... And I always always say to people, if you love something, because I think it's just important that whatever you grow, you know, you just mm-hmm. love it, you know, for whatever reason, you, you love it. But there are definitely some things which just sort of make more sense in containers than others. So, for example, if you contrast tomatoes, which we've said are, are good, you know, they do take a bit of a long time to grow. But if you contrast that with parsnips, for example, and I love a parsnip, um, you know, a parsnip takes as long, if not longer, than a tomato to, to grow it, it takes up pretty much as much space but at the end of the year you know you're picking one one parsnip whereas tomatoes you know you're going to be picking them you know potentially every day for three two three four months um even and also when you harvest your parsnip you might find it's got lots of holes in it because <laughs> it's been eaten by <laughs> by slugs or something yeah, and then you contrast something like um, broad beans, which, again, I absolutely love broad beans. They're one of my favourite um, plants. But if you grow a container full of broad beans um, and you harvest them, at the end of the harvest, you'll probably have enough. Once you've shelled them, you'll probably have enough for, like, one or two meals with, like, a small pile of broad beans on the side. Whereas if you go runner beans, I grow them in most sort of supermarket crates. I can get, sometimes I get like 10 kilos of runner beans off one container. And um, that is a lot of runner beans. That's more than, we don't need to grow them at the allotment or anything, because to be honest, I do like runner beans, but 10 kilos is, is absolutely plenty for us. Um, and even in a bad year, we'll probably get get five years. So it's just that some, some plant, and whereas, you know, things like herbs, you know, you can pick them every day. Every day you can go out there and you can pick them and use them. So they're brilliant things to grow in containers. Salad is really good because, you know, you want it on your doorstep. It's really nice to eat it really fresh. Um, whereas things like the things which grow really slowly, I guess, are the things, so things like purple sprouting, broccoli, and the big root vegetables, which take a long time to mature. Um, those are the things I'd probably be less less suitable. Great advice. Runner beans are a funny thing because I don't think uh, many. Uh, well, I know this for a fact because my when my dad moved to Canada, when my parents moved to Canada, my dad was very surprised to go into a garden centre and find that runner bean seeds were being sold in the ornamental section because they aren't really grown for their pods as edibles they're more grown as a a sort of a temporary screen as you would do sweet peas which kind of blew his mind so i'm not sure that many americans grow runner beans but they should be because runner beans are absolutely delicious and as you say such a heavy harvest i always think of allotments and sort of when you see an allotment site with like a 12 foot row of runner beans and you're thinking gosh I hope they've got a big freezer because that's going to produce a massive crop. It's just amazing. Yeah, and when you eat them small, they're they're really delicious. And of course, French beans. I mean, I mentioned runner beans, but French beans or pole beans, which I think are grown mm-hmm. uh, more in in Canada and America, are almost just as uh, productive and just as and just as pretty. Um, as well, and that's another nice thing about growing them in containers at home. Is that I make this sort of wigwam of of and, and having the orange flowers and things. Though I'm not growing it as an ornamental, you definitely get that benefit, and the bees love them as well. Yeah, the flowers are really beautiful. You know, I think there's a couple of varieties where the flowers are kind of red and white, and or some of them are just plain red. Um, I've grown the white blossomed one before, which is the bean that's used to make. Um, what when you go to Greece on a package holiday is called is in the cafes is sold as big beans, which is basically like a a tomatoy bean stew. Have you ever had that? I don't know if you've ever had that, but you can get the specific bean um, runner bean cultivar that they use to make those. Um, 
which are again white which are white flowered and, and um yeah you can get these very interesting oh, i'm going off on a bean a bean rant now but i do i find it fascinating the white beans look like the white beans are one of the beans. I always think of them when I've done workshops with kids. I've, I sort of bring them along. These are magic beans because for dinner, there's something that does look magic about a white bean. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and planting it in the ground. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and they are good in containers, as you say, because you can grow a sort of a, a convenient amount rather than the uh, sort of <laughs> the crazy quantities you get if you have an allotment and you go for a whole big row. Uh, <laughs> but I, you've got to have a big freezer. That's the main thing. Now, we've haven't talked about the other uh, major issue that container gardening well any kind of uh, outdoor gardening can bring along which is pests I mean is it mainly I suppose it depends whether you're on the 10th floor of a, a block of flats but is it mainly slugs and snails what are the major pests that you're facing when you're container gardening I guess it it is I mean slugs and snails do <laughs> inhabit these spaces and they, teem, they even seem to get high up after a while as well um, and it's I think one of the, the challenges of that is it's sometimes quite hard to have a sort of balanced ecosystem mm. that you might have at the allotment with all the different things that might eat your uh, uh, slugs and snails but but I think you get most you know most of the things you know common things you potentially can get you know can get blight on tomatoes you can get um, aphids um, you can get flea beetles but I think it's like a lot of um, gardening, um, and and a lot of your house plant gardening. I mean, I'm I'm just guessing here, but how the main thing really is is plant health. And if you're able to keep your plants healthy, um, in most instances, you'll have much fewer problems with pests. And so, a lot of people who contact me and they say oh, I've got this terrible pest problem where I go it's really difficult to grow because there's so many um, aphids or so many uh, slugs and quite often there's an underlying issue and of most the most common reason is actually that the plants haven't been uh, watered enough and when they're not watered enough even if they survive they get the, the stress of not getting quite enough water uh, weakens them mm -hmm. and they become much more susceptible to a, a, attack so everything that you can do to, you know, um, keep them, you know, we talk about this looking at like the baby thing, looking after baby, making sure they've, they're, they're, they're well fed. I, I often spray dil very dilute liquid seaweed. So it goes, if you spray it on the leaves, it goes a very long way. A bottle lasts, it's expensive, but it lasts ages and ages because you only need to put like one capful in a, in a spray bottle and you need to spray it on the leaves and that will give the plants a lot of the, um, trace elements and things that they need. And that's a bit like a sort of a, the analogy I use, it's a bit like vitamins for plants. And that can help them grow more strongly. And they're amazing things, plants. You know, they're a bit like people in a way. You know, when we're fit and healthy, we're much more resistant to to getting bugs and being ill. And plants are exactly the same. So if you can keep your plants fit and healthy, they'll be able to do amazing things to fight off. You know, I love how they can produce chemicals in their leaves which make them taste bad <laughs> for example to to different pests they're, they're amazing so yeah I think that's absolutely right and I think people are often thinking that the norm is for there to be no pests and that's something they've got to achieve whereas there's always going to be they're always going to be there and as you say if the plants are strong then that allows them to grow past these kind of problems. I, I can think of a few examples, though, where large pests like squirrels digging something up yes. is a bit of an imponderable. Cats. Cats, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I suppose that's just a question of, of infrastructure to keep them out. Yes, I mean, it is It is reality of urban growing is that you do get, um, yes, you do exactly, you get things like uh, squirrels. Foxes sometimes dig up things i mean i even had a fox on my first floor balcony at one point wow. <laughs> which was quite <laughs> exciting um uh, but 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 i suppose it's we need to be for, guess, for, fortunate but we don't have i i get people who, who grow in places like south africa who have monkeys who come <laughs> along and just <laughs> steal everything so it's, <laughs> it's a lot easier um you know it's a lot easier often for us um than that but um yeah but there are you know it's, it's things like squirrels can be can be difficult sometimes and i do sometimes hear from people who tell me jane i've tried i've you know year after year i'm sowing my tomatoes and it just keeps going wrong uh, 
I mean, can you reassure, uh, first of all, can you reassure everybody that it's normal for there to be uh, <laughs> failures? And, and also any advice for people who just find that they, uh, they're really struggling with what they're growing and how can they kind of reset and try again? Yes, uh, we've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a big one on into into memes, um, but I did see one the other day which said, um, the best gardeners are the ones which have made the most mistakes, which <laughs> um, which I quite liked because I think it is I think it is it is often true, and that is part and parcel of of gardening. But then it is also, you know, you also do want to have successes and that's what's motivating. And hopefully most of us will have a mix, you know, mostly successes with the odd um, failure here and there. I think if people are struggling, the thing I would, one thing I would consider growing anyway is is microgreens. And the reason why I really like microgreens is that from sowing them to harvesting them, it only takes about two weeks for a lot of them. And some of them, it's even if radish will be growing about eight days. And the nice thing about that is it means that you you have success <laughs> and it's motivating and you you are learning by growing because you're seeing these these plants grow you're seeing them germinate and if it doesn't work it doesn't matter because you've only lost 8 days or 10 days and you just sow another tray and grow them again whereas you know your tomatoes or whatever you know if you've looked after them for 3 or 4 months lovingly and then you go away on holiday or they get blight or something that's that's very demoralizing so to build confidence and to build experience um i think microgreens are very good uh, a very good are microgreens something that you can successfully grow indoors provided you've got enough light yes most edible crops need a lot of sun or you know some sun i mean leafy crops probably can do okay with like three or four hours sun but microgreens because you're you're not growing them you're growing them to such a sort of small stage they will actually do okay. Um, I mean, they do best in one or two hours sun, but they will actually do okay as long as it's bright. You can actually grow a sort of worthwhile crop and, and they're one of the best things, um, you know, particularly if you want to grow inside and you want to grow productively inside and actually grow quite a lot of food. Um, microgreens, I mean, people form, you know, create businesses growing microgreens inside. You know, they grow enough to supply restaurants which means, you know, that if we're doing it at home, you know, we, we should, you know, it's not that difficult for us to grow enough to to grow, to you know, grow enough salad, for example, for our family to eat by growing microgreens, which is quite nice and rewarding to do at home. Give me your top six or top five microgreen to try, and and a, a thirty second summary of how to get started. What are the best microgreens out there? I mean, I like a, I like a really spicy, I like a strong flavour, like, um, as you say, radish or maybe coriander. But what what are your favourites? Okay, so the six, my top six would be pea shoots. Oh, yeah. Uh, sunflower, absolutely amazing sunflower. Um, crunchy, nutty, delicious. Uh, radish for speed of growth and for spicy flavour. Uh, coriander, rocket or Rocola, it's very good. And what would my sixth be? Uh, there's so many to choose from. Probably mixed mustards, actually, Asian mixed mustards, because they get the different different leaf colours and they have a strong, nice sort of spicy uh, flavour as well. That's I can't argue with any of that. That sounds like a great top six. And you were just saying about, about, about getting going. Well, I mean, one thing about them which makes them easy to grow is that a lot of them you can just grow from you know store-bought um you don't have to go and buy fancy seed you can just grow them from store-bought um pulses and things so uh pea shoots you can grow from dried marrow fat peas and coriander grows pretty well often from you know spice packs from a from a supermarket or the asian store um so that's just quite a fun and easy way to uh, <laughs> to grow them just sow them very thickly grow them in a seed tray sow them very and um, sew them very thickly and put them in a bright place on the windowsill. And um, in two weeks, uh, oh, coriander takes longer. Coriander is slow, but pea shoots will be ready in about two weeks. And uh, is there anything else aside from microgreens that you could 
class as something that looks like a house plant but is also edible? This is quite, a, I guess, quite a small subsection of our house plants. But is there anything else that you grow indoors that you regularly harvest from? There's a couple of things. Um, I grow quite a lot of herbs, things like basil, which doesn't like the cold outside. I've got a, a cardamom plant that I'm very pleased with, um, which seems to. I'm not very good at looking after house plants, so I'm not a very good <laughs> guess for you, really, because I tend to. My wife is the expert on the on the on the house plants, but even me, even I have managed to keep my cardamom plant alive for about five years, and I've even even been able to divide it and give it away to to quite a lot of people. And it's got an amazing, uh, it's, it's got an amazing smell. It's uh, it doesn't you in my house it doesn't flower and produce fruit, so I think you need a greenhouse for that. But it does produce a lot of wonderful uh smelling um leaves and, and the other thing i grow which is quite fun is i grow lemongrass inside at home as well just for me lemongrass stalks you get from a supermarket uh plonking plonk them in soil and uh you know like a cutting and that's quite a fun one to to grow inside can as well. you eat the cardamom leaves are they something you can put in a a curry or a salad you can use them like bay leaves so you can sort of use them to flavor you wouldn't generally eat them but you if you were doing like a sort of uh uh, i don't know bake curry bake or something like that you could mix them in or a pilaf or something like that you could mix them in with the uh rice and then just take them out at the end and they would impart that lovely sort of cardamom flavor oh my mouth is watering now um you reminded me that i need to go and sow some more uh pea shoots because i haven't done any for a while and i I absolutely they're my probably my favorite microgreen just so much fun and so easy um so thank you for all that brilliant advice uh is there anything else about container gardening that we haven't yet discussed any nuggets of wisdom mark that you need to impart i think one of the things that people don't realize uh, maybe is that it is possible you know if you if you want to it is possible to create a very worthwhile and potentially productive garden in containers and there are all these wonderful herbs uh, that you can grow and that are ideally suited and that you can you know when you've got a herb larder on your doorstep you can add them add herbs to your meals you know every meal you cook you don't have to go and buy the you know if you're doing an ottolenghi recipe or something and he lists four different herbs you know which makes you think well first of all you have to go and get them which is the right pain but they're probably quite expensive it's really nice just to be able to pop out onto your doorstep and they take up very little space um you put them on a ladder or something outside herbs are really uh uh you know particularly people who enjoy eating food and want to eat a sort of diversity of food because you can also use them to make simple dishes like you know an egg omelette or something if you've got some fresh sorrel or tarragon and things on the doorstep you know an omelette can suddenly be a like a really gourmet dish with some of those in um or a rice dish you know plain rice with lots of fresh herbs mixed through uh suddenly becomes a really uh delicious li- delicious dish so you know i think it's easy to think oh it's container gun but there you know isn't you can't really do much you know if you're growing food at home but actually i think you can do a lot and there's something about the small space which I think challenges our creativity uh, and also makes it a bit, you know, in a funny way, sort of almost more rewarding than growing in a large space because you're sort of managing to get a lot out of a small space. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, as you say, we, we just don't use enough herbs and you can just bung them in anything. It's fantastic. I'm glad you mentioned sorrel. That I think that's a very underrated uh, herb. I love a bit of sorrel and yeah, it goes really well with eggs and um, my the other thing I absolutely love, and I've not tried growing it in containers, but I always like to rave about it. And I'm not sure I've raved about it on on the ledge, so I'm going to just plug this now. Is um, have you ever grown a good King Henry? I haven't. I've been meaning to grow it. I haven't grown it. It's no. a Roman pot herb brought over by the Romans, and the trick with it is you have to soak it for an hour or two in heavily salted water before you cook it. But if you do that, it is uh-huh. the best spinach substitute ever. It's just the most tastiest leaves, and I think it would probably go really well in a container. Actually, uh, it's yeah, it's I highly recommend. And um, I mean, it's just, it's not the most uh, it doesn't look particular. The flowers are very boring and it, it, the leaves are sort of, 
it's it's not a particularly stunning plant, but I, I just absolutely love it for the um, amount of leaves I get off, off it every year. So I think probably that would go quite well in the container. But yeah, herbs are epic. One herb that I also like, which I don't know if would be container worthy because it gets so big, is lovage. I don't know if you can find a sort of a cut down size compact lovage, but I, I think lovage is another one that I love to have. And prob- I don't know whether I can even get that in the supermarket. Like some of these fresh herbs just aren't that widely available. No, there's, that's one of the nice things. There's loads of, um, I grow whole loads of different herbs, which you just can't really easily buy. And lovage, there is a variety of lovage, which um, I absolutely love. It's called Scots ah, lovage. Yeah. And it is a much more dwarf plant. It has really beautiful white flowers, a bit like cow parsley, but the flowers are edible as well and actually really flavoursome. Uh, so it's a really pretty plant, um, and but it's not the same. It's not a fug like, you know, the common lug- lovage is basically like a six-foot <laughs> tall plant. And I'm sure it is possible to go in a container, but not not that easy. Whereas Scots lovage, it does have a slightly different flavour to common lovage. I mean, it, it's very obviously lovage, but it's different. I really like it. Um, not everyone does, but I it's one of my favourite herbs in container garden because it's so useful. I mean, if you cook soups or risottos or anything, it's just brilliant from adding that like base flavour to to a dish. Or I also sort of chop it up really finely and add it to to, to salad. So, yeah, Scott's Ravage is a fantastic um, alternative for container gardens and small spaces. Well, that's a good tip. I was looking at some scotch lovage the other day i don't ha- have lovage but not scotch lovage and I, I nearly bought some so maybe i'll go back and get my hands on that because that <laughs> sounds great well herb chat is over it's it's been really great to chat to you mark thanks so much for all of your wisdom and uh just summarize for us where we can find you online i'll also put this in the show notes but it would be just great to hear where people can go and find out more about what you do Yes, well, hopefully, if you Google Vertical Veg, my website will come up. My name is Mark Ridgestall Smith, but of course, no one can ever remember my name. So I always say vertical, I always say vertical, uh, or spell it, you know, spell it. Obviously, it's hard word to spell. So, um, yes, my website is about, and I've also got um, a Facebook uh, page, which is Facebook, which is Vertical Veg, and uh, I've started quite recently on uh, Instagram. Uh, as well brilliant well it's been lovely to chat to you and i hope you have a fabulous growing season this year thank you very much jane it's lovely talking to you thank you for having me thank you so much to mark ridsell smith and do check out the show notes for all the information you need about mark his book and where to find other resources on container gardening If you are a Patreon subscriber at the Legend or Superfan level, you can go and check out an Extra Leaf number 112 recorded with Mark, where we talk about the wonderful world of wormeries. So not a compost heap, but a variation on the theme, another way of dealing with food waste by harnessing the incredible powers of a particular kind of worm. It's one of my favourite garden things, so you can go and hear that chat if you are a Patreon subscriber at the Legend or Superfan level. And just a reminder that there's a new feature on Patreon now, which is a free seven-day trial. If you want to try out being a Patreon subscriber at no cost, then you can do so. You can have your seven days and then cancel, and that's absolutely fine. Sample it out see what you think and if you want to stick around we'd love to have you that is all for this week's show i will be back two weeks from now that's friday the 23rd of june until then have a wonderful fortnight And if you're at a loose end and you need some houseplant chat, do go and join Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge over on Facebook, where the lovely group of people there who listen to the show will welcome you with open arms. If you go onto Facebook, you'll just find that at forward slash Houseplant Fans. All right, have a great week. Bye. Love you. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye. See ya. The music you heard in this episode was Roll, Jordan, Roll by The Joy Drops. 
The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Komiku, and Dizzy Spells by Josh Woodward. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.